thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I'm very, very, oh, it's just a stand close to the mic, very, very excited <laughs> to be here tonight as this is our inaugural Mullis lecture. Um, Ron Mullis has generously provided uh, funding for the Mullis Fellows Program, which provides full scholarships for two students each year focusing on housing, community, and economic development, or public-private development here at the Weitzman School in the City of Regional Planning Program. Um, this has been a wildly successful program. We've had 12 scholars so far, um, so many of whom are here today. Uh, many alumni, we're very excited to see you all. Thank you all so much for coming back. Um, this has been a very singular pleasure in my experience here at Penn, is working with these scholars, hearing their stories, hearing their funny stories, for sure, <laughs> um, and being in community with them. So thank you, Ron, so much. Um, another, oh, <laughs> uh, Thank you, thank you. Um, and part of Ron's generous gift is this uh, Mullis lecture, and I'm very excited um, to introduce our two discussants today. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce is Dr. Wendell Pritchett. Um, I have a one-page bio for Wendell, so I'm no, going to... Please don't read, please <laughs> don't, read it. Please don't read it. No. If there is a job in Philadelphia, Wendell has had it. <laughs> Everything but mayor. Yeah? Soon, right? Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Chancellor of Rutgers Camden from 2009 to 2014. 2008, Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Policy. Um, head of the School Reform Commission from 2011 to 2014. A PhD in history from Penn, a longtime Philadelphian. Um, task Force for Obama, Community Legal Services. Multiple books. You can do this. So we're really excited. <laughs> <Excellent. Excellent. laughs> you can find everything online, I'm sure. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Kenneth Scott, well known throughout the Philadelphia region for his support and commitment to community service. Um, after a career in engineering and science, he started his Beach William Penn Foundation career as a volunteer and currently serves as the president of Beach Companies, which is a multi dimensional um, approach to development that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Kent, Dr. Scott has taught um, in Katie Satage at the Wharton School in 2007. He received the Liberty Bell Award, one of the highest honors from the Mayor City of Philadelphia. Um, so please, let's give a round of sound for our two speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Kim. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of thank yous for me. One, it's it's always uh, fun to be in this building because I I consider myself a faculty member at the Whitesmith School. Also, I think I'm actually on the website. It's somewhere, right? All right. So uh, okay. so I think that's okay. that's accurate. Um, um, and so that that is one of the things I, I really want to just acknowledge and, and appreciate. I also want to thank Ron. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I was the provost when you created this program, and I'm pretty sure that when you created it, I said that's a great idea. Did I not? <laughs> okay. Okay. So so <laughs> so you know. It's just great to see it you know, become real um, in, in the form of lots of students and graduates who are going to do doing or going to do amazing work. So just thank you and congratulations. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kira reached out to me a couple of months ago and said, we're doing this inaugural lecture. And she said, I think you know Ken Scott. Um, and I said, yeah. So um, I was Ken's lawyer 31 years ago. Yes. Um, I think I was 15 and you were 17. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, and so, yes, do I know Dr. Yeah, Scott? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, it's so great to be here with you and re re reconnect. Um, and so tell us about Beach. And let's start. We're going to start with the history. Um, and then we'll get the second segment. We'll talk a little bit about what's a lot about what's going on today. And then we got to oh, sure. talk about the future, too. So yes. let's start okay. with the history. So Sure. So the, the, the history of Beach was called the... Beach Corporation, and the idea was uh, the William Penn Foundation, if people are familiar with that, uh, that's the family from uh, Rome House Chemicals uh, back in the day, and I guess it's now Dow Chemicals. And uh, so they had, they had various philanthropies and trusts. They started the William Penn Foundation. They had an ideal, there was a, the president at the time was a man named Dr. Watson, uh, Bernard Watson. And he did a lot, uh, kind of took the foundation from kind of their mode of, um, you know, always supporting the arts and the orchestra and those things to really dive into community development to make a difference. And the, uh, so the, the uh, not the founders, but the sons of the founders, uh, 
uh, John uh, C. Haas and his, his brother Frederick uh, uh, Haas, they, uh, they basically agreed and let, let Bernie set up these mini foundations around the city. So Beach is spelled B-E-E-C-H because it's named after trees. All their sub foundations were named after trees. And the ideal, you know, they planted it in different areas. Uh, so you're probably familiar with one of the other sister organizations that was started back in the 90s. Uh, it was called then the Sassafras Corporation. They got the cool name, uh, but it's known today as the Avenue of the Arts. So the creation of the Avenue of the Arts all started with uh, Dr. Watson, the William Penn Foundation, and the ideal to, hey, we're going to bring tourists um, to North Broad to you know, spur activity in the city and really put it together. So if you're familiar with the High School of Performing Arts well, in South Broad, that was the old library company that was um, put together by the William Penn Foundation, Dr. Haas, under the Sassafras Corporation. Uh, the Wilma Theater, the renovations of the Academy of Music. Uh, now it's called the Kimmel Center. Back then they were calling it the Philadelphia Orchestra Building. Uh, so that was all these projects that were done today. Beach was focused on North Central Philadelphia. And the reason they wanted to focus there was there was a university there, a couple universities still there, and, uh, but it had the highest in crime and poverty around the city of Philadelphia back in 1990. And so the idea was to bring in someone, and he knew the perfect person, was Floyd Austin. Floyd was from North Philadelphia. He's deceased now. He uh, was a retired banker from the old first Pensy Bank, and I guess he's involved now. That would be, I guess, Wells Fargo right through yeah, all the sure. different changes. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, but uh, he used to work for the Philadelphia Housing Authority. He was the president of the Board of Education. Real community person. Um, but also he was, had a very interesting life. He uh, served twice during World War II and the Korean War, right, right in Valley. But you would never know. He's the kindest, gentlest mm -hmm. person. Um, but yeah, was in the you know was in the, the heat of battle. But he really had the idea of like, okay, here's what needed to be done in the grassroots areas of kind of of community development, and really just started giving out grants. You know, Beach was just giving out grants like any other foundation, funding small operations, sort of boots on the ground in North Central Philadelphia. And we found that a lot of people, and this is before I came on board, relaying the story before I got there, he uh, discovered that a lot of people were interested in very different projects around, but no one was communicating with each other. So one of the most successful things that he got started that still exists today was networking through what we call the Consortium of Cecil B. Moore Organizations. And basically it's just about connecting people up, connecting the dots. You don't have to take a vote. Basically we're going to have lunch. Let's talk about community issues. Let's talk about what's going on. Uh, can me and Wendell get together and work on this project? You've been looking at, I've been looking at, and you've been wasting a lot of time when we could have pulled our resources together. So that's sort of how Beach all, all got started. And then since then, of course, Beach has really expanded because there's so many other needs in the community. So we have several organizations today. We have a community development financial institution because the, the area was redlined. Um, for banking, as a matter of fact, if you went from, if you're familiar with the city of Philadelphia, from Allegheny Avenue, which is sort of where Temple Health System starts, all the way down to, at the time, Fairmount, on the west side, there was no bank until you crossed the other side of the Schuylkill River, right? So, you no know, check cashing agencies. So we started, and this is a, 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 to show you how, now it's like silly and ridiculous, but we were one of the first organizations at our building to put in an ATM machine, an ATM machine, right? I mean, you know, this is ridiculous. An ATM machine so people could make deposits and have a relationship with a bank because we could not get a bank to open a branch in the area uh, back then. So. Like I said, you look over time, like how ridiculous is this? But again, you know, this is all step-by-step -step community, overall community development. Obviously, the housing was 70% abandonment in the area. You know, and the city was cool, sort of doing projects where we're doing these two blocks. We have funding for that, but the rest of it looked like a bomb hit it. And we were like using my, I came on board, started using my engineering skills to say, nope, we're going to do a systematic approach. Uh, you know, Floyd can take care of the politics. I'll take care of like the on-the-ground activities of what needed to be done. And I came as just a volunteer. I had a long you know, career in engineering. And, uh, but yeah, but we just started putting systems in place and to say, okay, what's needed, what's needed to bring businesses into the community? You know, obviously they need capital, they need finance, they need infrastructure. Uh, we were doing little projects, even like the sidewalks were so bad. I mean, they were just all crumbling. And again, this was a time when the city didn't have any money. Surprise. <laughs> so we actually took funding and actually replaced the sidewalk from Broad down to, I think it was uh, close to Ridge Avenue. Uh, just so, okay, we're trying to recreate a commercial corridor. So little things like that. Uh, That's that not a little place. thing, but, by the way. But yes, but but those are the, the systematic approach that you know we tried to take place. And of course we recreated our foundation. We also have a foundation that gives out grants twice a year and scholarships. And we also have a, um, uh, what I leave out, our Beach Community Services. It works with the schools and does a community newsletter. Um, 
got, uh, we recognize that there's nothing but bad news coming out. I had a lot of friends in journalism, had some experience myself in, in, with journalists, and realized that, okay, you know, you know, you're arriving, for those notes, you're arriving here today is the news. But if you get killed on the way here, unfortunately, you know, that might make the, make the news. So the idea was, oh, you know, how do we generate good news stories? Say, hey, this community's coming back and we want to redevelop. And uh, so then we started our own studio because, you know, uh, sending the news truck out sometimes, you know, it costs money, they're short of reporters. And we just came up with the idea, we'll just generate our own news stories. We will for form a partnership with some of the local television networks. For a while there, we had Comcast, NBC, like actually in our building, they have a studio. And we still have our studio today for public service announcements. But the whole idea was to generate positive stories of what's going on, not always there's a shooting um, types of things. And, um, you know, we, we have an annual jazz festival that we know we, we produce just to kind of get businesses, especially small businesses, um, to come out and support them that on any other festival that you would see someplace. Then we just had the Avenue of Treats for children. We noticed on TV one day that, hey, everyone's going out. These kids are having a great time in this community. We're afraid to come out at night as we're revising. So, so we're going to create a safe corridor for children. So we get about a thousand kids now come and they get to put their costumes on and march through several blocks and businesses give out uh, snacks. And we also give out information, community information, how to get a library card or any other social service activities while we have the parents out uh, to maintain those. A lot of work with the local schools, um, have actually worked and created and built uh, a few other schools. We have another school that's very much tied to the foster care system because again, as kids transfer around to different temporary foster care placements, uh, we thought it ideal with Floyd when he was here that, you know, how about we come up with a school where basically we can let the social service agencies know and they can kind of always get transportation and kind of be educated and kind of keep, you know, some consistency um, because just jumping around, of course, uh, leads to failure. So, yeah, so that's kind of what, what that's the has been. So you can see, comprehensive community development organization. Yep. So, so let's stick with history for a little while longer, and then we'll talk more about closer to today. You alluded to challenges with things like paving the streets. So let's talk about the city of Philadelphia and city government and, and how you interacted with them back then, mm -hmm. and then we can compare and contrast to today and your hopes for the future. But also, uh, uh, I know, because you've shared them with me, lots of interesting stories about other anchor institutions like Temple and how you've worked with them over the year so to, to take us talk, talk to us a little bit please about the partnerships that you had what worked what didn't oh, okay so um, so yeah lots of uh, we'll try to do some community partnerships but uh, it's tough with the university it's very much uh, where Temple was very much walled off uh, at the time of hey you know don't go over there you know very concerned about safety still concerned about safety uh, these days but yeah so but very much very hard to get a partnership in with a lot of the universities and you no know, not just just temple but I'm always reminding them you know every time it's like oh we only come to the community when we need something right we, we want to build something hey we want to shut this street down and uh, I always remind them it's like well why is it that every time you get something is permanent every time the community gets something is temporary right and the other lesson to be learned that I kind of factored in after I kind of observed what was going on is, you know, we have to stop these handshake agreements. You know, this is, you know, just like anything else, you know, we, you need binding agreements that are enforceable um, down the road. So, so yeah, so we've had, we've had our ups and downs. And uh, James White is now deceased, but uh, he used to be the managing director for the city. He was a senior VP at Temple. He was on board. He was one that really was like, hey, we have to do a better job. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons Beach was created was to say, hey, we have this university sitting here. Uh, what can we do to really, you know, partner with them to be beneficial for, for everyone? Um, and, you know, the surrounding community, obviously, primarily African-American, black people. And uh, matter of fact, we did a little study one time because with a lot of friction, and I like data, uh, several years ago, I was like, oh, by the way, why, you know, this, 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 this friction that's going on, and people are always asking questions, but what is the relationship that you have with the, with the community? So as it turns out, at one point, um, people who actually live in the Sarah 29121 and 22 zip code, that they basically had never even been you know, in, a, in a temple building, had no relationship to, to the temple. As it turned out, it was just about maybe 6%. It was under 10% other people who have actually like visited, you know, the university, had any direct contact with them. Now, Temple Health System is something different. And they always say, oh, we're providing community services. And that's true. The community is, are the customers of Temple Health System, right? Without 
those people, there'd be no Temple Health System coming, right? But the university is a separate thing. They have a separate board. And uh, yeah, there's always, you know, seems to be some conflict. And yeah, there's some good things going on um, from time to time when you, you know you have these relationships. But yeah, but it's, it can be a bumpy road. Um, no different than the University of Pennsylvania <laughs> and community issues mm -hmm. um, around here. And, you know, what what used to be uh, made up of this community and some of those issues. As, as a recent example, we had mentioned just about the University uh, City townhomes down at 40th and Market. So we're kind of tracking a little bit because, again, looking at a documentary down the road, you know, what is the life change of living there and going to, like, the Penn Alexander School to now some of those families are in Olney and the schools that they were going to t attend, and you know what what does that mean? So so between that and just overall community relations, because again around Temple, I remember one of the former presidents said one time was at a meeting, and she said, "Oh, and the, the Temple community." She kept using this word, the Temple community, and the people in the community. Somebody stopped and said, "No, I'm sorry." Um, I think it was President Hart at the time. Um, I'm sorry. I just want to like remind you that Temple is located in North Philadelphia. North Philadelphia is not located inside the Temple. You know, you've got. 30 or 40 visiting, 30 or 40,000 visiting students, but it's 250,000 people that actually live in this community. And why are we always, you know, the, the afterthought? Why are we always at the bottom of the, of the food chain? And of course, it's important, it is an, it's an employer, people need jobs, they do employ people from the, the community that work there. Um, not necessarily in academics, if you look around, it's quite clear. Um, but yeah, but the other support operations, right, that comes from there. Um, some of the other things, uh, matter of fact, they had to fight recently. They're talking right now about the stadium downtown. Temple wanted to build the stadium. The community was completely opposed to it, and a lot of other people, and uh, even the police and fire commission had put notes in that didn't come out in the public saying, hey, this is a little matchbox area. Matter of fact, uh, you know, if you go through with this, traffic will be backed up from Vine Street, the expressway, all the way up to the Roosevelt Boulevard. And uh, in an emergency, by the way, it may take us as long as 20 minutes to get to someone because of this kind of congestion in this area, which led to the question, oh, so are we willing to let people die, you know, so that you can have a stadium, and not, not to mention the, you know, we won't even joke about the whole football situation, but, but yeah, but just the, the whole ideal of, of, again, we're going to close down certain streets. It's already traffic is backed up, but now they wanted to actually close off certain streets. Um, so what's the traffic pattern going to be? Um, as it turned out, you know, people wouldn't be able to park on the street. They would have to then, when they would have events, have to relocate from the neighborhood. They literally have to put their car, you know, several blocks away. Um, all these little things that weren't mentioned that were like uncovered when people were really hammering the community. Oh, they never want to do anything. They don't want to go for for anything. They're standing in the way of development. And yeah, well, sometimes you know, all development doesn't mean that it's good development, right? So, so and these were legitimate questions. They weren't just yeah. There's always naysayers that are going to complain, and you say yes, they say no. But no, these were just legitimate questions about, hey, you're affecting my quality of life. What, what about me? And honestly, on the other side, there were, you know, there's occasions where, you know, it was very clear. It's like, you know, what about you? <laughs> you know, this is development. We're moving forward. You know, we want to do this. So, so obviously the stadium didn't, didn't happen. There was enough elected officials that said, no, we don't, we're not going to agree with this. Community's opposed to it. There's too many issues. And, you know, that doesn't mean that it won't come back up again, but that's kind of uh, just reminding me as we're talking about the Sixers Arena in Chinatown, their, their, their concern, which are legitimate concerns. Um, it may move forward, but as I advise them, yeah, you better plant your flag and say, hey, you know, and what about our community? What assurances do we have with this? Because one thing that Chinatown can say, and they can point to, I mentioned this earlier in a conversation, if you look at Washington, D.C., they have a Chinatown community there. And then they built the stadium, which I forget what it's called now, what's the MCI yeah, arena, yeah. but whatever it's called down in, in Chinatown. And you can just look at the whole community. Where's Chinatown? Go visit. Where's Chinatown in Washington, D.C.? What, what happened? So, you know, they can definitely hold it up as an example of, hey, you know, how, how are we going to protect, be protected so the same thing doesn't happen to us? Obviously, economic development is important. You know, it creates jobs. And, um, things change. You know, we don't, can't keep everything the same. Uh, so yeah, so these things are important, but they're you know they're important questions. So when there are conflicts like these, and we'll start segueing into more present stuff, um, when there are conflicts like these, there are lots of different stakeholders and different participants. But one group that's usually at the center of development conflicts are planners, right? Yes. Yes. So talk to us about how Beach has worked with with the city, the city planning office, the um, uh, the city 
housing offices, all those different kinds of offices. Talk to us about how, how you've, you've worked with them, sometimes in conflict. Um, you know, what role do you see for young people like our audience who are emerging as the next generation of planners? How do you think about, what well, advice do you have for them? Sure, well, one, one is, is, is great. I'm always you know, uh, very proud to see anyone that goes into community planning. Obviously, it's, it's close to me, and, and, it's, and you know, having to deal with some of these social issues um, that go along with community planning. Um, of course, there's different types of community planning. Obviously, the market rate development and things that are taking place, and then there's affordable housing on, on the other side, and then there's a, a mixed rate of economic development. So, yes. Um, Okay, I just wanted to make sure you work on the fall. You can't work on the fall. It's like, oh, don't, don't, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> um, so yeah, so but no, always happy to to you know work and part whatever knowledge and wisdom I can can part to people who are studying community de redevelopment. But, it's, but tell tell them about what they're going to face because yes. they have hard jobs ahead of them. Yes. Right? Managing the conflicts like oh. a stadium or or even a community development project or affordable housing project. Yes, like yes. Give, talk talk hey, to us about not, how you've worked with them. Community development is, is not for the faint of heart. I can tell you that, right? It's, it's, the, the road can be quite bumpy. It takes forever uh, on some of these projects. You know, government move slow, it's not designed to, to move fast, and, and it's very, can be very frustrating. I come from a world of engineering where you know, things move very fast, they say put this up, you, you get it done. Uh, in community development, we have a project that just talked about a rec center, recreation center that we're doing. We started that process in 2018, it's now 2024, um, which leads to another whole thing where we say, oh, children are our priorities, but no, paperwork is often the priority. We, we, we joke about this all the time, that you know how important paper is to some people, and then at the end of it, it's just going in the trash anyway to be recycled or these computers will be wiped out. But yeah, it's, you know, this is the struggles of working with the city. Everyone comes with various ideals. And remember, you know, you're there as a planner, but elected officials, you don't know how long they're going to be there. And you know, they, have, they're, they're, they have a vision of what they want. You have a vision of, no, this is what's best, but now you're in conflict often times with you know elected officials. Perfect example, then we get to election, but oh God, by the way, guess what's gonna happen with HUD and some of the things that they were focusing on in Washington with a new administration coming in. So uh, it's sad to say that a lot of things you're working on, it's like, well, put it in the, put it in the drawer. Some of it will unfortunately go into the, to the trash um, on some of these community operations. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what you're working with and uh, just trying to you know, stay consistent. Uh, with your work, but yeah, so I mean, I have a thousand examples. Of, give us one. Of, give us of, one. Give us one. Well, so here's a, well, here's a, a, a change. So the change used to be a lot of the land in North Central Philadelphia, you could get it for a dollar. No one cared. Matter of fact, it was like, oh, you know, to develop, a, redevelop a, a house that was falling apart. People would say, why are these houses all abandoned? Why are they sitting there um, empty? Well, because you know the cost to redevelop it versus um, you know what you could sell it for, right, the, was out of balance. Now just the opposite, right? Because private development has come along and said, oh, by the way, that land is now worth $100,000. So a lot of original plans that they had for affordable housing all over the city of Philadelphia got wiped out because private development came in and said, no, we can do it. And the city is saying we can collect taxes on this, this is tax revenue. We don't have to subsidize it, which takes a long time. So yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of plans that were on the drawing boards got wiped out over the, over the last 10 years as not just in Philadelphia, but as redevelopment started to take place all over the, the city. Um, but some of the crazy stuff is, you know, some of this is just common sense things. You would think like, hey, this project is ready to go. Uh, there's 30,000 people on the wait list in the city of Philadelphia for affordable housing. Um, you know, why not just, you know, take some of the existing homes? It'd be a lot easier to put people in those homes than it is to redevelop new homes for those people who don't know. The, if you go for like low-income housing tax credits, just for like the average person, it's about $50,000 to get the application, somewhere between fifty dollars and $100,000 to get your application in because of all the consultants that you must hire um, to make that happen. So yeah, so for the average person, and the city's got 30,000 people on the wait list, they develop about 800 to 1,000 units of affordable housing every year. So how do you ever catch up? So it can be very frustrating, and then again, you're working for the government, by the way, as a planner, so hopefully they'll keep your training up to date, but I remember I had just left the utilities, they had this new CAD system downtown in the planning office, and it still was all wrapped up in the bubble wrap. And I was like, oh, you guys haven't uh, do that? It's like, oh no, we haven't gotten any training. We've got this equipment for, for years now. So we took the bubble wrap off and I sat down and I started like, you know, knocking out some, some drawings for projects that I wanted to do. And then I started running like a training class 
to train the people in the planning office of how to use the equipment because, but that seems unusual, but that's not that unusual, unfortunately. Um, those kinds of things happen all the time. So it can be very frustrating, um, but no different than a lot of other careers. And my daughter was like in the sciences as, as a lab person. She liked to do research, and, but depending on where you're working, it's like, oh, by the way, we're not researching that. We're, we're, you're gonna be working on the latest hair shampoo or whatever, it's like, well, I'm not interested in that. Well, that's what you're gonna be working on. And oftentimes in planning, you know, you have ideals, you have great ideals, um, but the frustration, just like in architecture, um, yeah, you're, you have great ideals, but the people you're working for are like, no, you're, you're working here. Here's the ideals we want you to work on. Here's the things that we want you to, to uh, process. So it can, be, it can be quite frustrating. And let me just mention about going out actually into the community, which is a whole nother issue. So if you're gonna be in community planning, depending on what type of planning you're going to, to do, step number one is you can't be afraid to get engaged to people that you're planning this community around. And all too often, you know, this, this would happen where it's like, well, we're gonna have a meeting. Uh, the meeting's gonna be this time of the year, it's gonna be seven o'clock and I have to go to the facility or I have to go to maybe a housing project. And you should see the look like, oh no, you know, we're not, we're not going there. Okay, how are you doing this work for people that you, when you're afraid to go and talk to the, to the people in the community? And yeah, I'm not saying that it's always pleasant and yeah, it's, and you know, you, you, your safety of course is, is a priority. But, uh, but yeah, it always amazed me how many people were sitting around making decisions who had no ideal, um, actually physically had never visited there. I sat on the board one time, again, we talked about the Avenue of the Arts, I was on that board, and one day they had their meeting and uh, the council president was upset about something. And he came to the meeting and said, and by the way, I'm looking around, how many people on this board have ever even been north of Vine Street on this organization that's supposed to be doing planning and activities for Broad Street on North Broad? And there was only, it was 23 people on the board and there was only maybe four people who actually had been on Broad Street north of Vine. How do you provide planning when you have never even visited the site? But again, that's not like a, it's not like a one-off. This is, this is pretty, pretty common on a lot of organizations. So when again, it comes from some of this is, uh, you know, we know what's best for, for you type of situation. Yeah. You got to educate it. You have to training. Um, but doesn't mean that, you know, you can overlook the people who actually live in that in that community, and is this something that, that they want? They actually live there, they're the stakeholders. And oftentimes people come in and it's like, oh, we're throwing our ideals on top of you. Oh, we think this would be, be great. Uh, I'll give you another classic example with, with Temple, uh, with just the naming of areas. We just mentioned Chinatown here in Philadelphia. So one time the president of the Community Development Corporation came to see me, and uh, he's like, yeah, we're having these issues, whatever, and it's like, you know, I just want to get some advice from you. And he noticed, he said, yeah, and by the way, you know, they stopped calling the area Chinatown, a lot of the things, they start calling it Center City East. And I'll say, oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's part of the change model. It's like, oh, no, this isn't Chinatown. You know, this is now Center City East for, for, for everyone to, to do away with this. So at Temple at one time, because North Philadelphia had this stigma, they were trying to push this title Temple Town. Oh, you now you're in Temple Town or whatever. It's like, no, this area has names. Cecil will be more community, Yorktown. These are well-established names for people who live here in the community. So one day on the Google Maps, it was changed. Someone from my office called me. I was out of town. I said, Ken, the, the name, uh, they happened to be taking a cab, and they noticed that on Google Maps because the cab driver was looking up. He said, oh, it's being called Temple Town now or whatever, the area you live in, Temple Town. They're like, no, they're very prideful. Cecil B. Moore community is named after civil rights leader Cecil B. Moore, right? Yorktown, some of the other things, no different than living in Fairmount or Spring Garden or whatever. And uh, so they were quite upset about it. So I said, well, let me see. I know a few people at Google. Let me see if I can research and see when did this change happen. And sure enough, as it turned out, someone from the city commerce department contacted them and said, yes, this is the name. You know, this is a concerted effort to change the name of the area. Um, but again, because we're trying to change the identity. So when it came back, I, I, they, were, they were like shocked, like, how the hell did you find that out? Like, how did you pin? Because I actually got back to the person who actually did it. So they were like, wait a minute. It wasn't the director, which I think you know, Alan. Um, it wasn't him, but one of the underlings. And he said, oh, well, we just wanted to give the name, Ken, that everybody knows or whatever. I said, no, you know, this was like a bag of potatoes. He was like, no, you wanted to give it a name so that basically take away the identity that it was being identified as a black community, right? That was it. The whole thing was, let's erase that piece off of it because we're trying to get other people to you know, move in to redevelop the, the area, redevelop the area. So did they change it back? Yes. That's what I thought. Oh, yes. I just want to make sure everybody oh, yes. knows. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. They, they took it off. You'll find it someplace. It'll pop up here and there just out there. But, yeah. But, again, that was a, you know, you'd be amazed. That some of these things aren't just, they didn't just happen by happenstance. These things are being targeted. Um, another example of that, sort of right here at 38th in Lancaster. 
So during the um, pandemic, there was an old bank that was closed and they started calling it the food bank. They were giving out uh, free food. Lines were, went for blocks, drive was very sad. I saw that they were, had constructed, they were constructing some new apartments across the street, modern apartments. And it used to be a school nearby, it was an elementary school, and it used to be University City High School. They're now all apartments in that area. And um, so, they, um, so I said to someone, we were talking about it one day, and we were out visiting, I said, oh. I said, by the way, how long do you think this, this food bank's gonna last over here? I said, because I'm looking across the street. I said, I can tell you right now that somebody's working on this to say, this has to go. We can't open new market rate apartments over here and then have people standing in line for, for food across the street. So they don't know it, but I'm telling you, somebody's working on this has to go and they will then put political pressure on. They will then look at zoning. They will look at all kinds of issues to make sure it's gone. So if you drive by today, it's been gone for, I guess, a year, year and a half, and now new apartments are being built. Not that I have anything against, you know, I mean, people need a place to live. I mean, that's that's fine. I, we are developers. We built thousands of units of, of housing, you know, affordable housing, some student housing, educational facilities. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, economic development is good. It's a job creator. Uh, there's nothing nothing wrong with that. But again, as I said, all development doesn't necessarily, new development doesn't necessarily make it good development. So so let's talk about that and let me raise the, the word that I'm sure students will raise in their questions, gentrification. So let's, so, so t t tell us how, how do you, let me, let, me, let me frame it in one way, but you can think about it a different way. What I heard you just saying is the question is, a question is development for whom um, and what's good development. So how do you define good development? So it, so it depends. So good development, one is, so when we started doing North Central Philly, it was 70% abandoned. And we knew that the development was to bring people who used to be in the community or other people who are of modest income to move back into the community. That's, that's fine. Um, in other areas, of course, you're in Center City, you're building high-rise apartments, whatever, that's, that's fine. It's a different quality of, of life. So, but, you know, it, it always gets to me when I see people doing development and it's like, oh, we're, we're coming and they'll have meetings with community organizations. Oh, this is going to be great development because we're uplifting the community. And I always remind everyone, let's just say, oh, by the way, so is this development for you? Are you going to be able to live here? Or is your family going to be able to live here? Or are you going to be completely priced out by the market and by the new tax situation that's, that's going to hit you? Um, so that's where it gets you know, to be a very delicate situation because we all know, looking around, like, oh, here's new development came in. Yes, the community is, i.e., Im improved, but improve for who, right? So, and then what happens to those people, as I just said, like at University of Town? Okay, and there's a big thing going on right now because people are seeing more homelessness in different places around the city. So this is the Kensington spillover. So yes, we can clean up Kensington, but you didn't solve the problem. You just shifted the problem around, right? And I call that being on the, I, I, I'm going to term the wheel of poverty, right? Where you just keep getting shifted around on this wheel. Um, we don't really solve any problems. We just like move you here, move you there you know, t uh, temporary solutions. But let me push you on it, just because I think you have lots to offer the, the, the audience on actually doing community-based development. So how are you defining today different than 30 years ago when you could get a property for a dollar, right? How are, you, oh. how are you doing it today as a community-based developer that you can look us in the eye and say, I'm doing it for the community, which I know you are. Like, mm -hmm. like help us understand how you're defining it today. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a, a lot different. Uh, you know, if, if, if I had to go back, we would still have land bank more properties because now they, to pick up a property in certain areas, like I said, a lot could cost you $100,000. That was easily for, you could have got it for free. The city would have been yeah. happy for you to, to redevelop anything on, on that lot. Um, so, yeah, so that's one of the things that, you know, we wish we had yeah. done more of, yeah. or the city, which actually created a land bank, which had, had some issues. By the way, I was a, was drafted onto that board, the original board of the land bank, in the uh, in the another administration days. I think you're familiar with that. Yes. So the yeah. So that's that's one of the things I wish wish we had done. But the development today, you know, it's very limited on how much you can get depending on the property. Who owns it? Does the redevelopment authority own it? Uh, some of the projects that the city owns, yes, you can still work with them to move some projects forward. But again, they don't have the inventory that they used to have. Uh, it's a little more complicated because other people are actually bidding on those properties, and you know the city wants revenue. So you're not just saying, oh, hey, give me the property, I'm going to do this great project. The other side of the city is looking at some of these pro land, you know, where the sites are located and saying, no, you know, we can sell that all for a market rate for $100,000. We, we, we want that revenue. We want that future tax revenue, right, with private development. So that's one of the, the biggest changes that has taken place. And also so much 
the rules have changed and so much more multifamily as compared to single family um, development these these days because they eliminate a lot of the parking rules and some of the changes in zoning. Um, a lot of people are upset all the time with zoning and, oh, we hate going to the zoning board. Why do we have to go to the zoning board to talk to people in the community? But that is the community's only chance really sometimes to say what's going on in your community next to you. You know, what is being built next year? Is this something that you that you really desire? Is this something that's going to be beneficial to the people in the community? But I run into developers all the time. It's like, you know, these people in the community, you know, uh, you know, uh, why are they always stopping progress? And, you know, and they, you know, it's my God given right to uh, build and make money. And, you know, so so there's a there's a lot of that <laughs> that that takes place. And I know many of them and, you know, and you know, I've worked with them on different things when we can work together. It's great. And. When we can't, then you know we just have to part ways. We we haven't gotten to the future. I want to take questions from the audience. Um, we'll, maybe we'll talk about the future after we get questions. But let me ask you one one more question related to this topic. So, what's a project that you're working on right now that you do think you think is working? So you you outlined a lot of the challenges in getting the city to rec recognize that turning over property to you is a better investment in the long run than probably some others. So what's one you're working on right now that you think is going to gonna happen and just tell us a little oh, bit about it. Sure. So we have one project that is a, um, uh, it's going to be sort of a mini Reading Terminal Market. Uh, it'll be on Cecil B. Moore Avenue. And basically the idea will be providing jobs to vending uh, for returning citizens. So it'll give them an opportunity to become entrepreneurs. They'll be able to sell stands. We're gonna make the cost of entry very easy. We may even be able to supply the kiosks and different things. And they'll be able to set up. And so it'll be like a, like I said, a small rating terminal with various services that they'll be able to provide. But it's really geared towards you know, returning citizens. Um, and that's underway. We hope to actually get started on that in maybe by the spring. So it's pretty much fully funded and on its way. Excellent. Excellent. Right, it was an old movie house. It's a very, very interesting building. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be able to knock that out. I want to hear even more, but I also want to make sure that people get to ask questions. So Akira, do you want to yeah. ma manage that part? And then I'll probably sneak in a couple more questions yeah, before we yeah. say goodbye. Lovely. But I, I'm sure there's lots of yeah, questions see. out there. So let's make sure that other people get to. Um, questions? Do we? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and you should make one up if you don't. <laughs> so, I've been taking notes. And, like, honestly, like, thank you for coming. Um, greatly appreciate uh, learning from you. Um, so, within real estate development, you're talking with a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders, and so you're developing a lot of relationships with them. And the key ingredient with like relationships, there is a level of trust. Yes. So I'm curious, um, what is your approach in developing trust within the community, trust within various stakeholders in order to get a project uh, completed? So, uh, so it's an excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. So very much, I mean, it takes time. I mean, you don't just walk in the door and people trust you. I try to explain that, you know, there's a difference between someone, you know, you, you know someone, for example, like on social media, and you really have a relationship with someone, right? Because Facebook kind of co-opted that word friends and people think, oh, you know, I got a million friends. Like, you know, really? You know, so same thing in community development. So it's very fortunate that the former president, Floyd Austin, was from that community. He had been there, people knew him from the school district, uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority, different places. So he had built up a lot of that trust that allowed me, my role, to just come and say, okay, here's what we need to do. Here's how we can do it from an engineering you know, a community planning effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but you know, so now of course I, uh, that trust has transferred on to me over the years. I've been there, you know, so long, I've known so many people, their families. Um, but yes, and one example I have to say that I love this happened not that long ago. Uh, so we built all these these homes, they were affordable housing. By the way, the first house that we that we redeveloped in the area, just to show you how things have, have changed, it was on Sydenham Street. And uh, the first house that we actually redeveloped, we decided we were going to get into the housing mode. And the house sold for $12,500, right? That was what, uh, 1994, that was Yes, yes. $12,500. So that same house today, last time I saw it was sold to someone, I think it was about, oh, it was like 220 or 225, something like that. So, so I mean, it is, it is a good financial investment uh, for people to build generational wealth, which I love. But the, but the story I was going to tell was, I was down talking to someone in one of the communities that we had redeveloped. This area, this strip of 19th Street, 
when I say the highest in crime and in, in, in poverty, this was just an open drug supermarket. If you haven't been up to Kensington, this North Central was Kensington before all the issues got in Kensington. Actually, a lot of it, unfortunately, got swept out and moved in that direction. And uh, so it was so bad, by the way, that we had, you know, it was rare to have a serial killer in your neighborhood, but not only did we have one serial killer living in the neighborhood, but we had two. We had someone living on 19th Street who had murdered, who killed like 11 women and buried them in the basement. Yep, this is the type of community development that you're we're getting involved in. We had another person uh, who was actually uh, killing people and eating them. Yeah, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. This is the kind of stuff that you can run into us in the, you know, doing community development when I say, okay, you, your heart has to be into it and, you know, you can't be afraid of, uh, you know, your investment of, investment of time in the community. But at any rate, so this all developed. These are now beautiful homes. There are many twins. There's front lawns, rear yards. There, are um, yeah, it's great, uh, you know, uh, as a sense of housing, but so I'm there talking to a, a, a neighbor, the school bus pulls up, and in the background I see the Comcast Towers and all that because there's only 16 blocks between these locations and Center City. And the bus pulls up, young lady jumps off the bus, she comes, she gives her neighbor a big hug, since it's not her parent, she's talking about her day, how was your school day, all of these great things that you would want to see in a thriving community. You know, we have a, a library that we've we finished in. There's a market now, there's, there's banks, there's everything here. And sometimes you have to take a step back. And at that moment, I had the moment of taking a step back saying, oh, you know, damn it, this is, this is why we do this work. You know, this makes it worthwhile. Because, you know, there's a lot of rough days where you're like, Shh, you know, like, why am I doing this? You know, like I was someone I go months sometimes without having a day off, right? That's what some young person says, oh, but you're the president of the organization. You just put your feet up and it's all great. It's like, oh, no, you don't see how the sausage is made behind the scenes. But that was a moment recently that really just touched me like, oh, and this is why we do this. Look at this beautiful community that we have here of people that were able to move back in. They live here. There's the Comcast Towers right there. We were able to preserve this. And they also were building generational wealth because, again, the house, those houses ran about sixty to $70,000. No, I'm sorry. The last batch was 80. Started at 60, last batch went to 80. And now they're probably worth over two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000. So, you know, they are building some generational wealth for themselves. And by the way, when we build these homes, they are tied in. So you just can't like, hey, let me go. You have to be eligible for, for it. And you have to stay. I mean, you have to make a commitment. Um, you know, the, 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 there is a lien on the property that says I'm going to live here. Um, you're not going to be able to just rent it out to someone. So there are some restrictions. But after X number of years, most of those people are beyond those restrictions. And you're, you're free to sell your house like, like anyone else if they so choose. But right now, I can tell you 99% of the original homeowners are still there. Um, they love their, their community. Um, a lot of people in development, by the way, in private development, always who want to, oh, you know, we're, we're making changes and people are moving out. It's like, well, you know, I don't understand. You know, people are, you know, we're offering them money and, you know, they're, they're getting $100,000. Like, first of all, where, where are you going to move that for? hundred thousand dollars these days but uh, secondly you know they're they're not interested in the money they have a sense of community they like, they like talking to their neighbors they like coming out and playing cards they like having a block party it's their whole quality of life you know it's not just about money oh we offer them money and you know now they can move on some people are transient like like that but for the most part no you know there it's more about them and having their sense of home their sense of community um that's kind of where they're at that's good thank you another question that was a good question. <laughs> um, first off, thanks so much for uh, sharing so much about your life and your career um, and also about being a family. Um, I guess for some of the students who are uh, living right now with people sort of taking news about the Sixers arena and uh, seeing the schools not invested in and the rents are on the rise, it can feel like uh, the city. Um, their ideal vision of Philadelphia is one that we're not in, is one that long-term residents and mm -hmm. people of color are not in. And so I, I, you touched on this, but I would love to hear about what your vision for Philly is and, and if you think we'll get to see it. Uh, in uh, the future question. The future question. Thank, yeah. thank you for asking it. Yes. yes. What's next? So what's next? No. How, I mean, how do you do it? How do you do it? Yeah, I mean, I see a much blended community just with the with the demographics. It's funny because it used to be affordable housing meant, oh, poor people and mainly minorities. Now, when I look at people asking about affordable housing, it's everyone who's like, I can't pay, 
I, I can't afford to live there. Young people coming out of school, and of course, student loans can be an anchor around your neck and uh, some of the other issues. But yeah, but now when I'm in Harrisburg, you know, affordable housing is a big buzzword. And it's about, hey, my kids are still at home with me and they, they can't afford to move out, right? They have all these issues. So now everyone seems to be getting more interested in providing affordable housing for the massive. Um, always laugh because I always love back in New York. Remember, they, they had who was they had the party of uh, the rents too damn high party. <laughs> so, which I kind of laugh with uh, with uh, when Tim Wells was when he first came up and he's like, you know, the mind your, your damn business party um, type of stuff. But yeah, that's but yeah, those those are the issues that uh, that I see in the future that it pretty much has to. It's sort of. Um, I wrote an article one time about the future of banking because we have a community development financial institution and about lending, how to get more capital into certain communities or whatever. And so, yeah, so it's still a struggle, but in some ways, you know, it's just, it's just, it's going to change because also banking is going to change. There's, you know, with technology, there's companies, for example, Apple. Apple has a hundred billion dollars in cash. I mean, you know, so you're already a customer of them and Google. So if they decide, oh, by the way, we can now give you loans over the phone or investments um, yeah I mean you know that's you know that process has already started everyone's going to you know fintech so th this kind of things are going to happen so the other thing is as you say to win a game you can't leave half the players on the sideline so the new demographics of these various communities well I was like hey if you plan on staying in business you plan on being successful then you know you're going to have to bring more people to the table these are these are your customers so I do see it being a more blended community. I do see some of those things happening. It's always going to be the oh we, the, the haves and you know the have-nots. But you're yeah in Philadelphia and some of the other major cities, it almost has to take place there. There has to be more diversity. Um, with another bank I work with up in in New York in the in the Bronx, and yeah, I started mainly focusing on Latinos, um, those you know black people. And but now when I look at like their customers and kind of what's going on or whatever, yeah, it's, it's multiracial. And, um, economics and just because of who's living in those areas and you know they realize that hey we can provide services to to everyone and a customer is a customer questions oh question from the dean oh it's gonna be a tough one <laughs> it'll be kind <laughs> Oh. And not, not a 76ers fan. Uh oh. Uh, but, um, <laughs> All right, cancel it. I'm pretty sure he's a Spurs fan. Spurs, Spurs. Uh, the, the Temple basketball game, which is the Spurs versus Temple, mm -hmm. um, this is just them being as a basketball fan, seems to fit. It seems to me that someone gave it some thought. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to uh, work reasonably well. Mm -hmm. Now, is that true? Or I was just biased because I played in the temple for two times I went over there. Yes. And I was feeling very good about uh, that see a temple man. Yes, yes, yes. But so, it, right. what, does that work? Or, or am I just. No, so that's a, well. That's excellent. There's a story that, behind it. Yes, right? excellent that 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 caught your caught your eye. So again, when, you, when we say there's always you know people who are opposed to stuff and someone wanted to build a football stadium, they're like, oh, and the community's opposed or whatever. Well, that was called before. That was called Temple called it the Apollo of Temple, and they wanted to build it. And Beach was one of the supporters. We were trying to create an entertainment district on North Broad with the movie theater. Uh, we had Freedom Theater, just various things, the Blue Horizon. But the idea was to draw people to come back into North Central Philadelphia. And so, yeah, so it was very well thought out how we're going to handle the parking. It's only going to seat 10,000 people. It's going to be some traffic, but it's not going to be a nightmare. So, yeah, there was a lot of effort and community effort involved in that. And that's when James White, Jim White, was over there on the board. And he was very engaged in making sure that, yeah, this was going to work out with the community. Now, there's always some politics behind the, the city council president at the time. You know, he was also using it as he as he said to me one time, and he'll he'll tell you because I guess he still teaches his his class on politics and civics. And, this is then Mayor Street. Yeah, Mayor Street, right? Well, at the time he was city council. Yeah, yeah. Uh, This was his district, yeah. and uh, he was getting ready to run for office, and we were talking about what's going on, and so he made it very clear, like, well, can you know, everybody needs an enemy, <laughs> and you know, so need to draw draw people like okay and by the way like you know let's let get to a certain stage and we need to say okay what's 
what's going to be the community plan? Why is how's the community going to benefit from this? Um, well, all the you know th those kinds of things to make sure everything was taken care of. But yeah, so but I would say former Mayor Street, he was one of the best planners. I'm telling you that I've ever run across as a strategic planner. So a lot happened under his administration, sort of like in the background, and you know, as far as a spokesperson and some of the other issues that they had. But if you go back and look, you know, at the sports complex, complex with the, the Eagle Stadium, the Phillies, um, some of the other development that took place around that time. I mean, he was really the, the real person behind that, driving a lot of, a lot of that. And I mean, and he very much cared a lot about the planning. So I give him all, all credit because some of the things I'm just like. What you know? What is going on? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? But he's like I said, he was like a long term thinker, and he's like, you know, you're you're here. He's already down the road and has already figured out the strategy. So you have to give him a lot of credit. Go back and like kind of follow. I wish he would like publish some books, but and kind of follow what he did and kind of his strategic thinking uh, behind it. But no, it was very well thought out. The community, for the most part, was behind it. That was the difference between this football stadium they wanted to build. People were. Yeah, we're engaged, like, yeah, this could be a good thing. They saw that we're going to do a movie theater, other retail was coming, there was other activity. Matter of fact, one time, this goes back a while, I was driving up Broad Street, uh, the Lear Chorus Center had an event. At the time, the Blue Horizon was open, they had a boxing event, and we had just opened a new movie theater. Batman was playing. And there's long lines on North Broad Street all over. And, I was, and again, it was one of those moments where you were like, ah, this worked. All this planning, all this effort went into this, and here we are today, and this full of people that were never on North Broad Street before that, right? It's like, oh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna travel up to North Broad Street. So, so that was a, a quite a success story. And I had to remind the current Temple people that because sometimes you know you get institutional amnesia that, oh, by the way, when you were complaining about this stadium, just remember the support that you had for this because it made sense to people. And, you know, there was some, some job activity, not as great as, a, as you want it to be. Matter of fact, one of the things that came up with the stadium, by the way, was like, oh, this is going to be jobs, there'll be new jobs, and you know, what? Play jobs five you, games yeah, a year. Yeah, right, what, yeah, what are you talking about? And <laughs> the other piece behind it's like, oh, and there'll be like opportunities for vending and entrepreneurship and all that. So then I had to remind them, oh, well, by the way, one of the failures at the current Lear Course Center is like, oh, by the way, how many minority vendors do you have right now? Because again, what is the best predictor of the future? So tell us right now, I was in the meeting, how many vendors do you have that are minorities, you know, primarily black. You know, what, what do you have right now at the Leo Course Center um, when you're talking about doing something in the future at the stadium? So, and you know what the answer was, right? Can you guess? How about none? Okay, so this is what you're currently doing, but you're going to tell me it's going to get better in the future? <laughs> so, yeah, you just, some of these things, so it's like, yeah, so that's, that's, that's part of, you know, in community planning, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, do a better job of thinking these things through of how this is really going to benefit people. What is the real purpose, you know, behind this? Because oftentimes, you know, new development just gets kind of thrown in, hey, this this works. Like I said, the current stand is sort of the, the fight of billionaires of, hey, we don't want to be at the sports center anymore because we want to have our own stadium because we want to hold our own concerts and we want to we want to make more money than being there. My and my ideal, by the way, that I thought, which goes back to the Way back when, who I forget who came up with, they were trying to move the Phillies in there. I thought 30th Street, if you're going to build a new stadium, put it at 30th Street. Put the platform over the over the, the tracks. It doesn't interfere with anyone's community, all the public transportation there. So it would be like um, Penn Station, right, with Madison Square Garden um, sitting on top of it. And I thought, well, that would be an ideal location. But, um, but again, I think there's another group, right, probably the Brandywine group probably has control of that. And it's like, no. And the whole idea was they don't want to share. They're not trying to have a... Partnership. It's like no, we we want to have our own, and they want to control it, and they have every right to every right to do that. Do you want one, one more question? One more question. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's been amazing listening to the conversation central around North Central. I'm a graduate of the University School of Social Work. I worked at the Rock School yeah. for oh, a bit yes. as well. Um, the area, as you know, Tom just got a new president, John Fry. Yes, correct. He's coming from Drexel and mm -hmm. was responsible for a lot of the neighborhood change in the area. Mm -hmm. um, they're implementing that new huge bid up and down Rock Street. And I know we talked about the future of Philadelphia as a well-needed community. How do we work to blend the different communities in that area when the incomes are so stratified between mm -hmm. the existing residents and 
those who might be moving in after a proof of policy. Right. So I, I so I, I sit on the board. Actually, I'm the board chair of another organization that was a spinoff of the Avenue of the Arts because again, there weren't people there that really were focused on North Broad, and uh, called North Broad Renaissance. And we always consider North Philly almost uh, socially brushy to be the big zipper because there's so many communities and so many elected officials that are tied in different sections of there. Mm -hmm. So it's very different from one end to the other. Um, so one of the jobs of North Broad Street is to kind of work together on the community economic development issues so that everybody can participate. Uh, that is one of their, their, their stated goals and they've been doing a very good job of that. Um, but yeah, but it, you know, it is, it is tough and, but you know, but it starts with just kind of letting everybody have a voice, right? Here's your community, here's what you're doing, here's what you're interested in. So that I don't come along and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I've got this great idea, I'm going to transform this and I'm going to put up a, a whole bunch of new shops and businesses and people are like, well, you know, did we ask for these shops and businesses or, and, you know, what, why are you, why do you show up all of a sudden out of the blue and assume that this neighborhood needs to be, because some people are very, very happy, not happy with poverty, but, you know, but they're overall happy with their housing and, and, you know, they have decent housing wherever they work in their careers and, you know, so, but, uh, but again, a lot of this, you know, new development, as we said earlier, isn't necessarily for the people who are living there. Of course, the city likes it, you know, it's, it's revenue, it's new revenue, um, it creates jobs, construction, lawyers, accountants, every, everyone's a transaction. And when you have a transaction, a lot of people um, make money. That's how they, they earn their living. And that also gets to a problem, you know, with and a lot of planning because, you know, once you build something, it's great, it's there, it's sitting there, it's being utilized. Um, but it's not a money maker for a lot of other people, right? So you need transactions. And, you know, so you're always looking to do new development, and, you know, rather right across Philadelphia or, or wherever, right? There's always like, you know, okay, we need new growth. Um, which is true, we do need new new housing. The, the country is growing. Um, so there's going to be a, a need for new housing and obviously new stores, new people come along, schools, et cetera. So uh, it's all part of the planning. Yep. Do you want to close this out or should I? Okay. Okay. Yes. But you're the, how many times do I say you're the boss? Yes. I know, do you want to close this out or you want me to? Um, yes. This is um, yeah, it's your question time. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, this has been, again, a delight to learn from you. Um, I, I teach the introduction course on history and theory for our city planners, mm -hmm. many of whom I see in the back. <laughs> I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> um, and this is something that is just a really, it's really difficult to unite someone who has this sort of long view and deep ties within Philadelphia, particularly in North Central Philadelphia. Um, so much of the development story that we hear is about Center City, it's about West Philly, um, particularly in West Philly, it's not always like a positive thing mm -hmm. to hear these examples. All of my students, for as long as I've been here, I've been trying to like, they come in, they're like, I want to be a developer, but I want to be a good one. Well, yes. <laughs> not a bad one that displaces people. And that's very, very hard to do. And you kind of talked mm -hmm. about these struggles of, right. Lots that look for a dollar and now going for a hundred thousand. How do yes. you like balance? How do you not lean into greed? Right. Um, and so I really like appreciate everything that you've done. And, right. and Wendell, thank you so much for yes. providing the context and the nudges. I know you all have a lot of like internal language. I appreciate you <laughs> making mm -hmm. sure that everyone understood um, all the stories and getting the most right. out of it. So I really oh, appreciate it. But by, by the by the way, I just thought of something that everybody here can relate to when we talk about changing the name or whatever, because you just mentioned is was West Philly. I mean, still called like Spruce Hill, right. sort of, but it was just coming known as West Philly, right. and then you know, sort of known as the Bottom because this was a primarily black community, right? Then we're calling like the Black Bottoms, meaning a lot of poor people. And then said, so, oh, you know, we need to change it. We have the universities, you know, we need to upgrade it. So we came up with a new name, right? right. University City. Right. Right, and yeah. that's what it's known as today, and that's all because they didn't want to associate. They were trying to disassociate themselves from the name of West Philadelphia and the black identity that the community had here in West Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, I was talking to someone, and we were talking about how segregated Philly used to be. So that if you were, I, my family grew up in South Philly, and as a black person, if I said I from South Philly, you knew the exact like five block radius that <laughs> yes, I was right, from right. in South Philly, yeah. and that's just totally. Now I live in Point Breeze, right? right, so right, right yes, like, right, right, It was always right. the name, but it's something yes. that because, like you said, the racial well, geography of Philly yes. in particular is changing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, the demographics are changing there again. So, you, yeah. are you in Point Breeze or are you in New Bowl? I'm in Point Breeze. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm not okay. That far oh, okay. <laughs> cool okay. Oh, because I was like, well, this is New Bowl. Exactly. No, where, yeah. Where'd that come from? Well, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you, Ken. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, thank you.